Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, this is the first time NIPS has had an award of this kind. Uh, it was introduced uh, by the, this year's program chairs. To, um, the, the aim is to acknowledge, uh, highlight, and, and celebrate major developments in the field from NIPS. The constraint for this award is that there were papers published in NIPS between 10 and 15 years ago, and the idea is to give enough time to give a, a more informed perspective about the impact of the work. So uh, I chaired the committee that selected the award, and, and it was certainly not an easy task. There were many strong candidates, papers that have had a big impact on the field. So the 2013 NIPS 10 to 15 year classic paper award uh, goes to Daniel Lee from the University of Pennsylvania and Sebastian Siong from MIT for the NIPS 2001 paper, Algorithms for Non-Negative Matrix Factorization. So uh, let me say a few words about, about the paper and invite Dan to come up to receive the award, unfortunately, Sebastian couldn't make it today. Um, so uh, Dan and Sebastian were both at Bell Labs. Uh, uh, and when this work was published, Sebastian was on his way to MIT. And I guess Dan was on his way to the University of Pennsylvania, um, where he's now a professor of electrical and systems engineering. Their earlier work had introduced uh, non-negative matrix factorizations as a way of compactly representing uh, multivariate data. The motivation came from, from neuroscience. Uh, finding sparse distributed neural network representations. Uh, and the NIPS 2001 paper formulated on negative matrix factorization as optimization problems uh, introduced a simple uh, alternating minimization algorithms based on multiplicative update rules uh, and analyzed their performance. And these algorithms are very widely used in practice today beyond their impact in, in machine learning. And, and we heard about them in one of the spotlight talks this morning. Um, this work has, has launched a whole subfield of signal processing where these methods are a standard tool for sparse representations of signals uh, in applications like audio source separation, for instance. So congratulations to Dan Lee and Sebastian Siong for the NIPS 2013 10 to 15 year classic paper award. I'm gonna give you, I'll give Sebastian. Sure, no problem, I'll make sure. All right. Well done, thanks. All right, thank you, Peter. Um, on behalf of Sebastian and myself, it's a, we're very honored to receive this NIPS Classic Award. Although, um, in my mind, classic is somewhat of a euphemism for antique or ancient, so it kind of makes us feel a little old. So I guess as uh, official NIPS old-timers, um, it's a pleasure to, kind of, to see the, the kinds of novelty and the mix of zaniness here at NIPS that allowed our paper to form. Um, at that time, uh, there was a lot of talk at NIPS and interest in probabilistic representations, sparse representations. And on the other hand, in, neuro, uh, in neuroscience, there was uh, questions about what are uh, biological constraints doing in learning. And so our paper was to take some ideas uh, in terms of simple non-negativity constraints motivated by uh, uh, positive firing rates and Dale's law in neuroscience and looking at how those could be applied to uh, 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 machine learning algorithms. Um, and in, in the ensuing time, looking back, it's, it's, uh, it's great to see some of these ideas still around and, and, and being propagated. For instance, at the time when we were doing our paper, we had considered binary constraints, but we thought that the combinatorial optimization problem was too difficult. And now we see that uh, some smarter folks here are able to overcome some of those difficulties. Um, there's also lots of connections. If you look at the uh, representations from a geometric point of view, you can see that these are low-dimensional kind of conic sections. Um, there's now been a lot of work in, in NIPS on other types of low-dimensional representations, manifold learning in particular. And I just want to um, point out, you know, kind of connections to ISOMAP by um, Josh Tannenbaum, Vin De Silva, and John Langford. Um, LLE by Lawrence Saul and Sam Roweis, who unfortunately uh, we lost a few years ago, as well as Laplace and Eigenmaps um, by Michal Belkin and Parthen Yugi, who we also lost. So in summary, um, this is just to honor all our friends here at NIPS, whose uh, influence has greatly shaped all of our work and all the people that we've lost over the years. 
Sam Rowice, Parthen Yogi, and Ben Tasker a few weeks ago. Thank you very much. All right, so we're going to start the, uh, the next oral session. Uh, so the first talk will be by Yao Yang Liu. Yeah. And on decomposing the proximal map. Thanks, Francis. So this work, in this work, we are trying to look at how to decompose the proximal map, which is used in many grading algorithms. So, oh, sorry. So a tiny bit of uh, motivation. So many machine learning problems can be formulated as you know, minimizing a loss function L and the regularize the F. So usually the regularize is a semi-norm. And a lot of recent work has been focused on you know, getting a sparse solution. And of course, we're interested in getting a computational efficient algorithms. So in order to discuss a family of algorithms, we need a technical definition, which is called, known as the Mohol envelope and the proximal map. So here we are taking a convex function F and we add a quadratic perturbation to it. And then we minimize, we take the minimum, then we get the M function, which is known as a Mohol envelope. So it's essentially a smooth of the original convex function F. And the minimizer is called the proximal map. So it's denoted at PF at point Y. So here's an example. So we take the absolute function, which is a black curve you see, and the Mohol envelope, which is a smooth uh, version of the absolute function. It's a blue curve. It's known as a Hilbert's North function. And the proximal map is just a well-known you know, soft shrinkage estimate, a soft shrinkage operator. So it's the red curve you see here. So it's saying it truncates everything towards the origin. And in particular, if you take an uh, indicator function of f, for instance, uh, it, it represents a convex set, then the proximal map is just you know, the projection, the usual projection. So based on the proximal map, there is a family of angle known as a proximal gradient. Some people also call this Easter or for backward, forward or backward submitting. So it consists of two steps. In the first step, we take a gradient step uh, with respect to the loss function L only. And in the second step, we take the proximal map with respect to the regularized F. And as I said before, if we take the L1 norm for sparsity, you get the shrinkage operator. And this algorithm has guaranteed the convergence. And its rate of convergence depends on you know, how nice the loss function is. And it's a natural generalization of the projected gradient algorithm, where the F is just an indicator of a convex set. And it also reveals the sparsely inducing property of your regularizer. As we, uh, for instance, if you have an L1 norm, you get the shrinkage operator. That's where you get sparsity in the algorithm. Now, there are a lot of variations of this algorithm. Some of the references are listed below. However, if you look at the algorithm carefully, there is a miracle there, which is in the second step. So in the second step, we need to compute the proximal map of the regularizer F. If it's, the algorithm is the L1 norm, it's not a problem. We know how to solve that exactly in linear time. However, if you go to more complicated regularizers, for instance, if you consider a structure sparse regularizer, which is written as a sum of simple functions, fi, then the proximal map of the function f, the sum, is not necessarily easy to compute, even though we can compute the proximal map of each fi. So the question is, how can we explore this structure to compute the proximal map of the sum? So here's a simple theorem, which says it's a known theorem. It's not that due to myself. So if you take two functions for simplicity, you take f and g, two functions, what is the proximal map of this sum? Well, it turns out to be the parallel sum of the proximal map of f and the proximal map of g. So this formula, computationally speaking, is not very useful because you have these inversions in the formula. And uh, you can develop a numerical procedure, it's essentially an iterative algorithm, to compute the proximal map of f plus g using subroutines of the proximal map of f and the proximal map of g. However, if you plug this subrouting into the proximal gradient algorithm, you have a two-loop procedure. And if you balance the errors carefully, the convergence rate can be rather slow. So this work is motivated by two previous wonderful results. One is due to Feynman et al. So what they show that if you take the one norm and you take the total uh, variation semi norm, and the proximal map of their sum is just a composition of the two uh, proximal maps. And another interesting result due to Janneton et al., which is about the grouping, a group lasso, where you have the groups, GI, which is a subset of variables, and if they form a certain system called the Namina system, then the proximal map, again, of the sum of these group seminomes is going to be the composition of these uh, proximal maps. And here, the group seminome is just a restriction of the LP norm into the group in the subset GI. So these two results motivate the generalization, which is 
is it true that the proxima of the sum of f and g is just a composition of the two proxima maps? Unfortunately, the short answer is no. And you can build a very simple counterexample by taking two linear subspaces. Here we have a blue subspace and a red subspaces. And the proxima map in this case is just projections into this subspace. They're linear projections. And therefore, you can represent the proxima map as a you know, uh, symmetric matrix. And if you compose two symmetrical matrices, it's not necessary to be a symmetric, right? And therefore, you can show there does not even exist a convex function edge whose proximal map is just a composition. So it's generally not true for the proxy composition. However, if we are less ambitious to require the decomposition to hold to a certain function of f and g, not all functions of f and g, there might still be some hope. Here, we have three equations, which are essentially you know, the definition of the proximal map. Uh, because we are minimizing these functions, we just take the derivative and set to zero, we get three optimality conditions. And then we add the last two optimality conditions, we end up with two optimality conditions. And a little bit of comparison of these two uh, optimality conditions, you get the sufficient condition for the proximal map of f plus g is going to be the composition of proximal map of f and proximal map of g. So in short, the sufficient condition says this. If you do the proximal map of f, then we only enlarge the subdifferential of G. Then we're guaranteed to have the proxy decomposition. And unfortunately, the sufficient condition is not uh, necessary at some boundary points of the domain of the function G. And I should mention that a special case of this theorem appeared in a proof of Joe et al. So once we have the sufficient condition, now the rest is easy. All we need to do is to find functions F and G to satisfy the sufficient condition in order to get the proxy decomposition. So here's a trivial result. So we fix one of the functions f and g, and then we require the proxy decomposition to hold for all functions g or for all functions of f. Of course, as you would suspect, this will give us only trivial solutions. Essentially, in the first case, we will get a, a constant function for f, and in the second case, we only have a continuous linear function for g. So this reassures the impossibility to have the proxy decomposition in general. However, I will show you uh, two cases where we do get interesting results. So just to remind you, this is a sufficient condition we have before. So because many regulars are, are, are semi-norms, they are positive homogeneous. So we take a positive homogeneous function g. And this is equivalent as requiring the sub-differential of the function g to be invariant up to uh, a positive scaling. And because of the sufficient condition, all we need is the proximal map of f to be proportional to its input. Therefore, we can uh, have the sufficient condition. So the, so the work, the remaining work is to characterize functions f whose proximal map is proportional to its input. And in terms of we have four char uh, equivalent characterizations, and I'll explain some of them. So the first two equivalents was done by Dinozo and Shokov, Nasir and Lips. So essentially it says if you have a function f which is an increasing function of the Euclidean norm, if and only if for all perpendicular vectors x and y, fx plus y is bigger than f of y. So they use this result to characterize the representative theorem in kernel methods. And now, thanks to this theorem, we have more characterizations of the representative theorem. And the second implication, so which essentially says if you have an increasing function of the Euclidean norm, then the proximal map of f plus any positive homogeneous function kappa is going to be the composition of these two proximal maps. And one particular example is we take the function f to be the Euclidean norm squared. And then you can compute the proximal map using this result. And in particular, if kappa is the L1 norm, you get the so-called elastic net recognizer of Jogan and Hasty. So more generally, this theorem says if you, have, if you add an L2-ish recognizer to a problem, then computing the proximal is essentially free. So this uh, L2 issue regular does not cause you any problem in computing the proximal map. So this is another result I mentioned before due to Jonathan et al. So it's a group norm, and again, we can recover this theorem by take F to be the largest group and the rest as a, a positive homogeneous function couple. And you do this iteratively, you get that theorem for the Euclidean norm. And they also prove the case for the one norm and the infinity norm, which can be recovered using a second result. So here again, we have the sub, uh, sufficient condition so in this case, in this case, we take a permutation invariant function f. For instance, you can take an LP norm, which is permutation invariant. And due to the rearrangement in equality, you can show the proximal map of the invariant, uh, of a permutation invariant function is going to be co with its input. So here, co means if you uh, 
look at the pairwise orderings, the two of the two vectors, they have the same ordering information. So using the sufficient condition, all we need is the subdifferential of the function g to be invariant to the homoton, all homoton vectors. And we need to characterize such functions. It turns out uh, these functions are just the shock wave integral, also known as the lower extension of some set function. So in short, the shock wave integral is a uh, generalization of the Lebesgue the integral into uh, any monotone set function mu, which is not necessarily a measure or, or charge. So uh, to put things together, we have this theorem, which says if you have a permutation invariant function, such as LP norm, and if you have a function G, which is a shock wave integral of some submodular function, then you have the proxy combination. So here we need submodularity because uh, we need function G to be convex. So again, we have some uh, implications of this theorem. I will just mention a result due to Frank Spark, who proves that uh, the case for the function f, which is the uh, L1 norm. So here's a nice trivial implication. So this norm known as the Oscar norm, so it's just a sum of all maxims of the pair of the pairs. And this norm is used by Bondel and Ratch for grouping features uh, in statistical applications. And to compute the proxy map of this norm is not entirely trivial, and it's done, it was done in John and co -work. And here, using this uh, theorem I showed you before, we can easily compute the proxy map by regrouping the, norm, uh, the sums. So essentially, we decompose the sum into uh, a sum of functions kappa i, and then using the theorem, we can show the proxy map of this Oscar norm is going to be just a composition of these kappa i functions. And because each kappa i plus one, we only add one more variable. So given the previous proxy map, we only need a constant time to compute the next proxy map. Therefore, uh, we, if we compute the whole thing, we only need a linear time to do that. So, so what if the sufficient, so I show you a sufficient condition, which you know, is easy to prove. And what if the sufficient condition fails? Well, there are two results. First, uh, a result due to Martin's detail. They show that if your regular rise satisfy a certain shrinkage assumption, even if even though the proxy component is not true, you can still use them in a subgrading algorithm, and your algorithm is still guaranteed to converge. So it's essentially an approximation. And another result uh, due to myself is uh, a very simple linearization of the proxy map. If you have a proxy map of a sum of functions, you just need to uh, you just need to compute. Uh, you just do a turn expansion essentially. So you do a first order linear approximation of the of the proxima of the sum. And then this surprisingly this simple linear approximation will give you a strictly better result. So to summary, so we have uh, posed the question. So we have two functions f and g which are uh, is that and we also the question whether or not the proxima map of the sum is going to be the composition of the proxima maps. And we present a sufficient condition which uh, which essentially says if you do the proxy map of f, we only acknowledge the subdifferential of the function g. And we identify two major cases where we can show uh, interesting non-trivial proxy combinations. And these results are uh, immediately useful if you plug uh, these pro pro combinations into the proxy grading algorithm and will give you a uh, faster algorithm for your problem. And thanks. So we have time for a few questions. Micro microphone, please, maybe. No microphone. Well, uh, so for nuclear norm, these norms are unitary invariant, essentially. Microphone. Oh, oh, microphone. So he's asking about the nuclear norm. So essentially, the nuclear norm is a, belongs to a family of so-called unitary invariant norms. So essentially, it's an LP norm, or the L1 norm on the singular values. So most of these results extend to that case. All you need to do is require the, the, the norms are unitary invariant. And you, need, you just reduce to a vector case. So essentially, it's the L1 norm. So you and you still just need G to be a Lovash extension of a submodular function? Uh, G needs to be a spectral function, which is also a Lovash extension, I think. So you need to enforce a certain unitary, unitary invariance in the function G as well. OK, yeah. thanks. So another question for Yao Liang. So 
I have one. Yeah. Uh, so in the overlapping group plus O case, yeah. uh, you've shown that for three base groups, yes. then you use the prox map decomposes. Yes. So are there other sets of groups for which this is true? Uh, this, uh, the tree structure, so this or equivalent the laminar system is the largest group I know, which you can show this result. There is another group in, uh, so essentially, if, well, if you take a forest, of, so essentially if you have disjoint of these tree structure groups, then it's mm -hmm. still true, but that's the largest group I know, yeah. Okay. So I don't know any other uh, structures in the. So no more questions? So let's thank Yao Liang again. So the, the next speaker is Ai Shao Zeng, <coughs> and he's going to talk about non-uniform camera shake removal using a spatially adaptive sparse penalty. Uh, okay, thanks for the introduction. So the title of my presentation is Non-Uniform Camera Shake Removal Using a Spatially Adaptive Sparse Penalty. Uh, I'm Hai Chao Zhang from Duke University. This is a joint work with David Whip at Microsoft Research Asia. So the problem we consider here is the camera shake blur, which is actually caused by the relative movement between the camera and scene during the exposure period. And the objective here is to recover the sharp image from a single blurry observation with unknown camera shake. This problem is extremely challenging, firstly because it is a well-known ill-posed problem. Even under the simplified convolutional observation model, there are many pairs of image and kernel can jointly uh, explain the observed image equally well. And the fact that real world camera shake are actually spatially varying, this makes the problem uh, even more challenging. So here, to model the camera shake blur, we use a projective motion path model, which basically models the blurry image y as a uh, weighted average projectively transform the sharp image X. So this observation, obs observation model can be written into the form that is linear with respect to the combination weight W. And here, each atom in the dictionary D would be a transformed sharp image. And also, on the other hand, this observation model can be also written into the form that is linear with re respect to the unknown sharp image X. And here, each atom in the, dic in the dictionary H will be a, a localized blur kernel. Assuming Gaussian noise, we, will, uh, we can derive the likelihood function from the observation model. And to elevate the ill poseness of the uh, problem, image prior is typically uh, placed. For example, uh, sparse gradient image prior. And prior on the combination weight W can also be used. Given the likelihood and um, different priors, a straightforward approach would be take the map estimation, which uh, is equivalent to a standard regularized regression framework. Although this estimation is uh, straightforward and simple, uh, this map estimation typically suffers from local minima issue and often produces a no blur solution, which means uh, explain the blurry image as a, as, as a blur image itself convolved uh, with a delta solution in the simplified observation model case. And to make it work in practice, different empirical tricks, such as initial, initialization and structure selection, should be uh, included to make it achieve successful deblurring. Here, instead of direct map, we take a type two estimation with the same uh, likelihood function and parameterize the Gaussian image prior. With type two estimation, we first integrate out uh, the unknown sharp image X and then maximize over all the other unknown variables. Here, a uniform prior on the uh, combination weight parameter is uh, used. And this 
uh, type two estimation is equivalent to this following uh, minimization of the cost function. The challenge here is that the log determinant term uh, is uh, high dimensional and hard to calculate. We here introduce a diagonal upper bound, and this will actually uh, let us derive this final simple cost function for non-uniform deep learning. And the first term in this cost function is a simple reconstruction error term. And the second is a sparse penalty function, meaning that the uh, function, penalty function phi here is a concave non-decreasing function of its variable. And the last term is a simple uh, uh, noise, noise level penalty term. So uh, this minimization of the cost function can be achieved using the standard Majorization minimization technique. And by looking at this uh, proposed cost function, uh, it has a very similar form as a standard map estimation. So we may wonder what's the real advantage of it. So to see that, we uh, first go back to the second challenge, which is a real world camera shake are really spatially varying. This spatially varying blur actually will make the column of the matrix H imbalanced. The reason for this is that each column on H corresponds to a localized blur kernel. And under, under the constraint that each localized blur kernel uh, should have non-negative elements and the uh, sum to one, therefore large blur will have a smaller L2 norm. Therefore, due to the spatially variant uh, property of the blur, columns of H will have different L2 norms. And the effect is that this will bias the image recovery process and therefore affect the overall kernel estimation. And back to our model, we uh, mentioned that there is an automated column normalization feature embedded. We first note that in the panel function, there is a local kernel norm in embedded. This will actually compensate for the spatially variant of the uh, blur. To see, to see this, we first denote xi multiplied by the uh, norm of the local kernel with a new variable, vi. And we can actually uh, reformulate the cost function on the top to the one on the bottom. While the one on the top is a, uh, is a sparse estimation problem with an imbalanced uh, column, the one on the bottom is a standard sparse coding problem with normalize the dictionary, D, uh, H tilde. This automated column normalization feature will actually avoid premature fearing of any one element of, of V over another, and thus avoid, avoid the biased image recovery. And in the recovery process, only large structure, low blur region will be uh, naturally emphasized the first. Uh, this automated column normalization feature is crucial for non-uniform deep learning. To see this, we use an example that compare our result with, uh, with this feature embedded and by removing this feature. You can see that by removing this feature, the algorithm cannot achieve successful deep learning. And this uh, column normalization feature is only the principal first step towards uh, non-uniform deep learning. And to move forward, we, uh, uh, we go back to the first challenge, which is the eopotentness of the problem. To elevate the eopotentness of the problem, typically sparse penalty is placed over the image. And here we mentioned that there are actually two different effects of the blur on the sparsity measure. The first one is that the blur will actually reduce the signal sparsity, therefore increase the sparse penalty value. And the second uh, effect is that Blur will reduce the overall signal variance, therefore uh, decrease the sparse penalty value. For penalty function that is not concave enough, meaning it's not sparse enough, uh, this second factor will actually dominate, meaning the sparse penalty function will give a uh, lower penalty function value over the blur image. Therefore, uh, it will favor the no blur solution. Based on this line of reasoning, to really favor the sharp image over the blurry one, a very concave penalty function has to be used. While this is attractive conceptually, it will introduce a non-convex optimization problem 
and where the uh, local minima would be a great issue. And with this analysis, we go back to our model. The panel function in our proposed model is firstly a qualified very concave sparse penalty, meaning as the noise level approaching zero, the penalty function approaching a scaled version of L0 norm. Therefore, it will be helpful in avoid no, the nobler solution. And the second property is that the penalty function can adjust its shape according to the noise level. At the beginning, when the noise level is large, the function, penalty function uh, is less concave and approaching a scaled version of L1 norm. Therefore, it will um, has less problem with the local minima. And as the noise level get reduced, uh, the penalty function becomes more concave. And therefore, with those two properties together, eventually the nobler solution will be uh, avoided, hopefully. And uh, along with the estimation process, the local minima will be avoided progressively. And for the problem of camera shade removal, initially, as the uh, noise level is large, so the penalty function is less concave. Therefore, the algorithm will de-emphasize high blur regions and focus first on the large structures and low blur regions. And later, as the noise level get reduced, the relative, relative concavity of the penalty function is increased. And with this, more fine details will be recovered. And just now, we mentioned the penalty function is adjusting its uh, penalty shape according, according to the noise level. And the third property of the proposed model is that it can actually uh, learn the noise level. Therefore, make, uh, making the overall algorithm is uh, free of a tuning parameter, which is uh, desirable for a uh, practical problem like uh, deblurring. And here we'll show some uh, experimental results using real world blurry images from uh, literature. And we compared with uh, several state of art methods. And we note here that all the compared results are from the original authors directly. And this is the first uh, test image. The blurry image is from uh, Helmling, uh, NIPS 2010. And here is our deblurred image. On the left, we show the estimate the kernel patterns. It actually show that there's a uh, camera rotation involved. Here on the left, we compare with the result from the original author. And this is enlarged the region. It can be uh, seen from the comparison that our deblurred image is uh, with sharper structures. And this is a comparison with a method by White, CAPR 2010. And here we can see that although two, uh, both methods can recover very sharp image, our recovery result has less raining artifacts. And, uh, uh, this is another work in uh, ECCV 2010 by Gupta et al. The uh, result by Gupta is, has some uh, remaining blurry effects in some region, while has some uh, raining artifacts in another region, while our result has, uh, is free from both effects. Uh, Hirsch and Hamlin and others uh, have a recent work in ICCV 2011. Here, here we compare with their results. Our res uh, recovery image has actually has more uh, fine details. And this is an interesting comparison with a uh, work by Joshi, SIGGRAPH 2010. Uh, the method of Joshi is actually a camera shake removal method using hardware assistance by uh, actually using in inertial measurement sensor. And it, it is interesting to note that although without any hardware assistance, our method can recover a sharp image with even fewer artifacts than the one from uh, hardware assistance. And finally, this is a uh, comparison with a very res recent method by Cho et al. Uh, Pacific Graphics 2012. The method of Cho is an uh, image pair based method. It requires uh, two blurred images at the input. While our deblurred image is an 
using the, only the first blur image as input. While uh, both methods can recover a reasonably sharp image, we can show here that actually our method, even with a single um, image as input, we can recover uh, better details, such as this text region. And to sum up, we propose in this work an uh, effective approach for uh, non uniform camera shade removal with a simple and clear cost function. Uh, we then analyze the model property, including a uh, an automated column normalization scheme, which is crucial for non-uniform camera shake removal. With this uh, feature, actually high blur, low structure region will be de-emphasized first and will be emphasized later progressively. The second problem is noise-dependent homotopy continuation. And by learning the noise level, we can uh, approach uh, achieving an uh, algorithm uh, free of tuning parameter. The proposed method can achieve state-of-art performance on real-world blur images and might be uh, applicable, applicable to other problems such as structured dictionary learning. Okay, uh, welcome to our poster tonight, and that's all. Thank you. So before we start questions, could all like spotlight presenters get closer to the podium right now to avoid like uh, delays later on? So questions for the speaker? You know, versus having uh, ground truth data, do you, you physically look at the pictures and you look at regions with sharpness and uh, regions with blur? Uh, we actually also have a like a quantity uh, evaluation on standard data set, um, like a uniform deblurring. There's a data set by Levin et al. We can also achieve state of, state of, measure, uh, state of performance. Here, uh, you saw that it, it might be more uh, like uh, interesting to compare directly, visually, how the different algorithm performs. So, yeah. So is that online data set a ground truth data set, or is it a known good method? Here. Uh, all those test images are real world uh, images. So there's no ground truth for the results shown here. So what I'm just thinking, and it might be crazy, but does it make sense? You could build some kind of a camera rig, right? Some half silvered mirrors and things like that and send the same lens to two different uh, cameras and you could create ground truth that way potentially. And yeah. then you could quantitatively do sort of a least squares comparison or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. I. Firstly, I agree with your uh, uh, suggestion. And uh, another point is that uh, the measurement, like least square, is actually um, kind of inconsistent with the visual perception. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's why we didn't uh, pursue a non-uniform test uh, data set in quantitatively directly. So yeah, thank you. Other question for the speaker? Oh, you mean a failure case? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the question was, uh, are there any failure cases? Yeah, uh, definitely there are. Uh, there are some failure cases because uh, you know the camera shade removal is an extremely hard problem, especially when you consider the non-uniform one. So um, uh, there are definitely some feature cases. And what I show here, that those images are standard test images. Um, and when I capture a real photograph with, uh, with a, like a handheld camera, um, there, are, uh, let's see, there are many unknown factors that will uh, cause the algorithm feel, such as the uh, like the uh, very heterogeneous region due to the uh, lights. And uh, when you take the, uh, take the picture in low light setting, there are high noise. So under those situations, because the current model doesn't model those factors, unknown factors, it will cause the algorithm feel. Yeah. 
Thank you. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again.